the front. This is our prayer period. We ask that the congregation come. Those who choose to come to the front, we ask that you would come right now. Those who choose to stay at your seat, we ask that you would stand if you're able. And if you're not, that's okay. But we ask that you would stand to your feet. And then we ask whether you're at the front or whether you're at your seat, we ask that you would just reach out and ask someone, can I hold your hand? Can we just connect? For it is a demonstration that each time that we come to the Lord's house and as we hold each other's hand, it is a demonstration that we are one in Christ. We are connected as the body, regardless of where we live, regardless of what we've gone through, regardless of what our status is in life. When we come to the Lord's house, we pray that all that is put aside because we declare that we are brothers and sisters in Jesus the Christ. And it is his Holy Spirit that unites us. It is his Holy Spirit that binds us together. So that we will know that we're not walking this journey alone. So it's in this spirit that we ask that we continue to connect. And if you're not saved, I want you to know that God desires that you be saved. That means that you be rescued from the penalty and the power of sin. That you receive his eternal life. And so with bowed heads and lifted up hearts, let us pray. Dear God, we come now. And we adore you. We honor and praise you. Because we've come to realize that you're God. We come to acknowledge your sovereignty. We come to acknowledge your power, your presence. We come to acknowledge your righteousness. We come to acknowledge your holiness. We come to acknowledge your goodness, your love, and your mercy. We acknowledge, oh Heavenly Father, that you loved us so much that you came down through 42 generations in the person of Jesus and the Christ to save us from our sins. So we acknowledge you as our Redeemer, as our Savior, as our Lord. And then Lord, once you, through Jesus Christ, completed the mission on Calvary and you raised him in three days and you ascended to sit on the right hand throne of the Father. You sent your Holy Spirit to preside, to empower, to indwell every believer in Jesus the Christ. To help us, oh Heavenly Father, in times of difficulties. To help us in times of uh, hardship. To help us when we are not able to help ourselves lord we come acknowledging the holy spirit as our enabler as our helper as our presider now lord we come and we know that there are those who are coming with heavy hearts some are coming with joyous hearts come are, some are coming with uncertainty some are coming with insecurity and there are those who are coming with boldness and coming with courageousness there are those who are coming oh heavenly father walking through the valley of the shadow of death and there are those that you've brought through the shadow of the valley of the valley of the shadow of death but however we come we come bowed heads and lifted up hearts because we know, Heavenly Father, your word says that you are God who answers prayers. And we come, O oh, Heavenly Father, as a collective body of believers in Jesus Christ. Lifting our prayers up to you because we know that you exist. We know that you are real. And we know that you hear your children's cry. So Lord, we come now and we pray that you will forgive us for our sins whatever we've said and done throughout last week whatever we've done and said just this morning lord we ask right now that you forgive us for we know that you are god who's already done it 
and our asking is an expression. It's our way of communicating that we believe that it's done. And we believe what you have done. And we believe who you've done it through. So we just come saying, forgive us. Have mercy. Have mercy on us. Now, Lord, we ask that you will continue to, to bless those hands that are being held right now. Bless them with health and strength. Bless them with peace that surpasses all understanding. Bless them with your presence. Bless them with your power. Bless them with your patience. And those who are not connected, oh Heavenly Father, but their hands are being held, bless them with salvation. That they will come, oh Heavenly Father, to, to open up their hearts and their minds to receive the good news of Jesus Christ. Believe what he's done for them. He died. Buried and was raised from the dead with all power because he, he desired that they be saved. They would have eternal life. Bless them right now. Convict their minds and convert their hearts. Compel them to come. Bless those in nursing homes. Bless those at home and sick. Bless those in the radio listening audience. Lord, bless those in ICUs and CCUs. Bless those who cannot pray for themselves. But we stand in the gap interceding as you intercede for us Lord we ask in the name of Jesus that you would bless those who have hospital visits on tomorrow possibly operations those who are at home recuperating from operations allow them to know Heavenly Father that their doctors didn't do it their specialists didn't do it We've come to realize, oh Heavenly Father, that we have appreciation for the specialists and the doctors, the nurses. But Lord, we come to realize that you are the great physician. And Lord, you touch where no doctors can touch. You touch where no medicine can touch. Lord, we just keep giving you honor. We give you glory. glory. We, we give you all the praise. Because it's you that works through available vessels. Now bless this church and bless churches all over this United States of America. Unify us. As Jesus prayed that his church might be one. Continue, your heavenly father to send us who you want us to have. And continue to send us what we need. Lord we thank you for those that are planted here. And we pray that you will bloom them. We pray that you will grow them. We pray that you will mature them that they will come to understand that your purpose exceeds and transcends their plans and purposes let them know heavenly father in your word you say seek me first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you help us to have kind words one for another help us to forgive one another help us to love one another that, that, that this, this, this city, this state, this nation will see you through us. Desire to become a part of this fellowship. Bless in the name of Jesus. It's in your precious name we ask that you would bless families everywhere. Children everywhere. Grandparents everywhere. Bless right now in the name of Jesus. It's in your name we lift this prayer up to you. Let every heart and mind say amen. amen. And amen. amen. And amen. amen. Oh, bless me. Now, my Savior, I come. Anybody is coming to him to to 
to thee. Anybody need him this morning? I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Anybody? Anybody? Every hour, I, I need thee. Oh, bless. Anybody need him to bless him? Anybody need him to bless her? Now, my, my say. Come naked, I, 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 I come insecure, I, I come hurt, I, I come downcast, I, I, I come to Amen. 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 We're going to prepare our hearts now to hear a selection from our choir, and afterward we prepare our hearts to hear a word from the Lord. Come on, let's put our hands together. How many come to praise the Lord? Has God been good? For the rest of my life. For the rest of my life. I'm For the rest of my life. For the rest of my life. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For the rest of my life. Say, uh, Show. For the rest of my life, 
for the rest of my life. I'll serve the Lord. Thank you, choir, for reminding us, reminding us of that. Because he's been, anybody he's been so good, not just good, but so good. Anybody he's been so good to. So good. Not just good. So good. Can, can I just remind you how good he's been to you? And, and he, 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 anybody been traveling up and down the highway lately? Anybody been traveling through the airways lately? He's been so good. Yeah, yeah. Anybody been to the doctor's office lately? Any, any, anybody been through an operation procedure lately? I just come by to remind you he's been so good. Anybody been sick? He's been so good. Anybody had any family members sick? He's been so good. Anybody been employed for a period of time? And he opened up a door that you didn't think he could open up? He's been so good. I'm going to tell you what my, my spiritual father used to say. Pastor Cameron Alexander, when he would go through these litany, he said, keep sitting there, him. As if he has not done anything. Just, just, just keep on sitting there as if. Not telling you you have to stand up. Not telling you have to shout. Not to, No, however the Holy Spirit moves upon your heart to help you understand he's been so good. You may just raise your hand as a testimony. I, I know what you're talking about. It just may be a nodding of your head. It may just be a patting of your feet. Maybe standing and running up and down the aisle. However the Holy Spirit moves upon your heart that he's been so good. Any military people up in here? God and brought you from Afghanistan, Iraq, Korea, and you come back to Fort Benning, come back home to retire. I just come by to let you know he's been so good. Anybody, he's he's gotten you through the valley of the shadow of death lately. He, he's been so good. Can I just tell you one way that I know he's been so good? He saved my soul. <laughs> While I was on my way to hell, there's somebody else was on that same train. And because of Jesus, I just come by to tell you he's been so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll serve him. For the rest, don't nobody have to beg me. For the rest, don't nobody have to ask me for the rest. When I come to know how much you love me, I do it for the love of God through Jesus the Christ. Is there anybody in the house? I just heard Brother Purdy. He was excited. He was saying, "Get excited!" Amen. See, there are some things that come over the airwaves and come through the newspaper, come through. Uh, Instagram come through the chat group and come through the all of the, the technological advanced uh, things that we have available to, to us through the iPhone, the smartphone, and people get excited about that. Is there anybody in this house? Somebody said Fort that no, Albany State in Tuskegee is going to be playing over in Phoenix City in a classic. Is there anybody in the house? Now, I don't know where you hang on that, you know, whether it's the Whitewater Classic, we have the Morehouse Tuskegee Classic, we have the Fountain City Classic, and all of that, but there were some excited people about that. Is there anybody in the house? And if I can get excited about a football classic, I ought to be, be excited about Jesus. Is there anybody in the house? I'm gonna get to the text. I just, I, I'm just excited about being in the Lord's house. I don't take it for granted that daddy said you'll come to understand son when I used to cry, when I used to get excited in the pulpit, it's not because I'm down and out. I'm just thankful for God. He just let me be here one more time. The rest of my life. 
I'll serve. Amen. God bless you. Turn to the person on the, on the next to you and say, uh, I'm excited about being in the Lord's house. One more time. Turn to, him, turn to a person next to you and say, he's been so good to me. Amen. Now, if they didn't say anything to you, that's all right. They may have been expressing it in their heart. Amen. Amen. God, thank you, choir. Thank you so very much. We want to go to a passage of scripture in Acts of the Holy Spirit. Acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Acts of the Holy Spirit, chapter 27. Acts of the Holy Spirit, chapter 27. Now, I want to look at verses 21 through 25. Our actual text verse is going to be verse 25. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version, the English Standard Version this morning. Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27, starting with verse 21 and ending with verse 25. Amen. If you're there, God bless you. If you're still turning, just say, hold on for a minute. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 27, verses 21 through 25. Let us hear what Luke is writing under the power of the Holy Spirit as he records this. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet, now I urge you to take heart for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. Amen. 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 I want to use as a sermon title, God will bring you through. That excited me when I was reading this text. God will bring you through. I don't know what you're going through, and I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you will go through, but one thing, if you don't get anything out of this message, I pray that you will come to know some things we have to know, and we have to know God will bring you through. On this, on his way to Rome, Paul and 200, approximately 76 others were shipwrecked. Paul had warned them that it was too stormy. May have not have been the right time to cast the sail. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. And yet, instead of listening to one who was in solidarity with the Savior, yes, they listened to another voice. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. To another voice. They said, yes, Say. And my brothers and sisters, there are some lessons that we can learn from this story that God has provided through the writing of Luke. Yeah, yeah. 
that can really help us when we find ourselves in dark and dare and despaired and disappointing and discouraging situations. Yes, there are some things we need to know as we travel through this, this wilderness here on earth. As we travel as strangers through this, this barren land. As we sail on the sea of life where there will be treacherous storms, there will be tsunamis, there will be all kinds of difficult and challenging situations. And we need to know one biblical fact. And that is God will bring us through. Young people need to know that biblical fact. Children need to know that. Parents need to know that. Grandparents need to know that. They need to know that God will bring us, us through. No matter how dark it may seem, God will bring us through. But there are some things that we must surrender to to make sure that, that, that we are available to what God desires us to to be responsible for, in order for us, for, in order for him to bring us through. So I want to just lift up three points and then we're going to be out. Is that all right? And you ought to just make mental notes or you ought to just write them down. And if you can, ha if you can tweet, if you can Instagram, you can even take a picture, selfie as they call it, and just, just, just send it and hashtag it. God will bring you through. Somebody need to hear that sitting right next to you. Maybe someone need to hear it all around you. Someone in the radio listening audience need to hear. Someone maybe still in bed. Maybe you need to just go ahead and, and just text them and just go ahead and say, God will bring you you through. Yeah. So you may ask, what is the first lesson, Reverend Flakes? We ought to just learn that we can know from this story that this shipwreck Paul and these others that has landed on the island of Malta what is it that we can learn? Well, the first thing that you need to learn is that you must listen to God. In this day and time where we have all kinds of noises in the world, we have all kinds of things that we put in our ears. You know, there are, t there are people who you can just, even in their cars, they have these earplugs or these, these earphones, you know, and they're listening, they're texting, they're ready, you know, they're doing all, they're multitasking. But we need to know that we need to be in tune with God. If we don't, we will experience heartache and loss. The reason a lot of people get into problems that they get into because they're listening to everybody else and not listening to God. Sometimes people place more weight, more value in what other people may say and they may not even be mature Christians. They may say that they are, but they're not mature Christians. And I, you want to know the difference between how you can recognize a mature Christian versus a mature, uh, an immature Christian? They always start off by what they think. This is what I think. This is my opinion. But when one is listening to God, they want to instruct one to be in tune with what the word says. 
What does God's word say? And I just come by to tell you that, that God is not just in some people just still thinking. And, you know, they just think that God is just, just still speaking and, you know, auditorily. And, 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 and they can hear they wait for this voice to drop down. But you have to read Hebrew chapter 1 says God spoke in sundry times and he's still spoken divers in many ways to the to the prophets meaning he was referencing back to the Old Testament in terms of the various ways and the many ways that God spoke and he did yeah. but there is a transition within that text and it says in these days God has chosen. Now let me just say something. You can think whatever you want to think. And I, I know people say, well, God can speak in whoever and whenever and however. And you're absolutely right. We never box him. But if you read that text closely, he's already chosen how he speaks to us today. And it says he speaks through his son, Jesus. The word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. God has chosen to speak through us through his Son. Anything you want to know about God, you need to know about Jesus. He said, I don't do this on my own. I, I do it because the Father has sent me. The Father has told me. Is there anybody in this house? God has left his Word. He has left his Holy Spirit. He has anointed and he has called his pastor preachers according to his own heart to feed the flock with wisdom and understanding. And yet, Paul stands up and says, "You, if you had to listen to me, we wouldn't be in this situation that we're in. Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss. Have you ever told some, your children that you need, to, you need to follow mom and daddy's voice and yet they're listening to somebody outside of the house? Is there anybody in this house? You know, maybe you've been speaking to your wife and maybe your wife has been having other people speak in her ear. Maybe your husband having people speak in his ear. Maybe your sister, your brother been having them speak in their ear. And there comes a time that you need to sit down and say, Lord, guide me. Let me get to a quiet place. Let me put off the television. Let me put the cell phone down. Let me put everything around me down and let me commune with God. Let me listen to his word. Because every problem that you're going to face, the answer is in the book. It's in the word of God. And sometimes we get so caught up with our feelings, our emotion, that a lot of times we allow our feelings and our emotion to cause us to make choices and decisions that goes against what God is saying. Is there anybody in this house? And God's word never contradict him. Paul says that I tried to warn you, but the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the majority decided that we should sail on. You have to be careful with trying to hook up with the majority. Majority can get people in a lot of trouble. Just because you have a large number saying one thing, it may not be what the word of God says. Large numbers don't validate is there anybody in this house? It, it does not validate that this is the right thing to do. You want me to give you an example? There was a majority in the Old Testament. You have to go over to Deuteronomy. You have to read it. Is there anybody in the house? A matter of fact, 12 went out. 10 came back. 
They saw the same miracle. They saw the same signs that God had performed with the children of Israel. They saw that God opened the Red Sea. Is there anybody in the house? They saw that he led them by cloud by day and fire by night. He, they saw that he fed them when they got hungry. They saw that he gave them water in the middle of a wilderness. They saw the same signs. And yet when they got to the brink, to the mouth of the promised land, God said, send twelve. The majority came back and says, we can't take this. Have you heard people and turn people, we can't do this and we can't do that. And, and, and you may have, but two may say, yes, we can. We can do it. A whole generation missed the promised land because of what the majority said as opposed to what God said. Is there anybody in this house? I know feelings may cause us to listen to ourselves. I know emotion. I know doubt. I know despair. But if God says it, he'll get you through. He will get you through. Notice being in the majority doesn't make somebody right. Who are you listening to? Who? Who, who are you listening to? Do they know God? Do they know, know God? Let me just drill down a little further. Do they know Jesus? The author and the finisher of our faith. Because a lot of people say they know God, but they don't know Jesus. And I know we are living in a society where we are diverse and, and, and we are plural, a plural society. We, we have many different ways they say to get to God, but, but Jesus says, I am the only way now. You, let's get this straight. Don't get this twisted. And I know we've become a very permissive society that we don't want to be perceived as being judgmental, and we don't. Is there anybody in this house? But we do have a discerning spirit. We investigate. We ask. We examine. We audit. Is there anybody in this house? We ask the question, but there comes the time that every one of us has to ask the question. And do I truly know Jesus? Who are you listening to? Are they walking by faith or by human reasoning? And oh, my brothers and sisters, I know we're living in a world of intellectualism. And let me just say that. Uh, Christianity is not an ignorant religion or it's not a religion, it's a lifestyle. Let me just say that. But there are those who want to make you think that Christianity is not only ignorant, but it's unintelligent. We're in dwelt with the most intelligent person you will ever find, you will ever encounter, you will ever come in contact with. His name is the Holy Spirit. He's not ignorant. He's not come on somebody. A matter of fact, he's the one that brings discernment. He's the one that brings wisdom. And the Bible says when you are wisdom, you fear God. You reverence God. The fool does not reverence or acknowledge that God is who he say he is. Is there anybody in this house? Don't let the devil hook, wink, and bamboozle you and thinking that, you know, a lot of people get PhDs and DDs and MBAs and MDs and JDs and all kinds of degrees. And let me just say this. It's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, we were just basically encouraging that at our scholarship, you know, uh, ministry yesterday. We wanted to give all the access to information to our children so that they can go to the highest level as it relates to secular education. But one thing we want them to understand, you can get all the degrees in the world and you can become one of the biggest fools that can ever walk the planet. Is there anybody in this house? Because if you do not have a BA degree, if you're not born again, Paul says all of this stuff is dung. Is there anybody in this house? He's saying it means absolutely nothing because let me just tell you, all of this is going to pass away. No, we're not saying that you're not to go and get the highest education. You're not to go and basically be equipped. But let me 
me just say something. Do not let your education cause you to come to a point to question or either to inauthenticate the word of God, to, to begin to say, I don't see it that way. My education tells me something different. There are atheists out there. They are real. Whenever you don't believe in the word, you don't believe in God, you don't believe in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, you're traveling down a dangerous road. He is real. So Paul says, I tried to warn you, but you wouldn't, wouldn't listen. So I just come by to tell you this morning, God will bring you through. It doesn't matter how dark it looks. You may not see the light at the end of the tunnel, but if you're in solidarity with the Savior, you need to understand that he has given you everything that you need to endure, to persist. He's given you everything you need in order to be able to continue to walk through the valley. He's given you everything you need to have hope in a hopeless looking situation. You just have to keep your eyes stayed on him and know that God will see you through. You, you just, you, you, you must listen to God. Than your feelings, more than your feelings, more than others who may not know the power and the presence and the provision of God. Number two, number two, number two. Not only must you listen to God, but you must understand the purposes of God will always overcome the plans of man. Amen. The plans of humanity, the plan of women. You must know that all things work together for good. For those who, what? Love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Is there anybody in this house? Why have we been called for his purpose? In order for us to be a witness for him. Is there anybody in this house? God can actually make mistakes work for your good. He doesn't beat us down when we make mistakes. He, he doesn't beat us down when we have difficulties and we made choices that may not have been the best interest he doesn't use that against us he used it to grow us and to mature us he used it to be stepping stones to the next level we can grow stronger our character can become stronger but do you not know there are some people who do not know how God works they will see making mistakes as a defeat and failure I was just telling our young people yesterday, I said, you need to learn, to, you need to learn that failure does not mean defeat. Amen. We keep teaching our children that they are not allowed to make mistakes. They're not allowed to make a D or F. They made A's all their lives, but when they get to college, things gets a little bit more difficult. And when they make that C, if we have not taught them that there's going to come a time that you're not going to always make A's and not always going to make B's, but there's going to be some adversities in your life. That does not mean that that adversity defines who you are. God can use it for his good. Because sometimes if we start making an F over here or C or D over that, that means that I have to step back and reevaluate where my time is going. It means that I have to regroup. I might be spending more time in my extracurricular activities and I'm not spending enough time studying for this particular difficult course that I'm taking. I, I need to re-examine. God can use it to continue to grow me and mature me, to bring some things to my attention that I need to know that will help me down the road. But if I always think that I'll never have adversity, then when adversity comes, it blows me away. I become so depressed I become so defeated because I find that, that the reality is, is that I'm not all that strong. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not all that perfect. And, and there come a time that God has to take us through some things to bring us to a reality to know that God is able. We have to lean and depend upon 
upon him. We have to know his purposes. Have you ever asked the last time what God's purpose is for your life? When the last time that you prayed and asked God to guide you according to his purpose? I may have my plan, but that may not be God's plan. Is there anybody in this house? Through this shipwreck, Paul landed on Malta, was part of the Roman province of Sicily, and, and introduced the gospel to his people. You never know what God has intended for you. The disciples didn't want Jesus to go through Samaria because they didn't like Samaritans. But Jesus had a purpose. Of going through Samaria. You may not ever think that God has a reason for you walking through the valley of the shadow of death. He just wants you to know if he's got one through it, he can get you through it. The shadow of the valley of death just means that I have to keep looking up. Is there anybody in this house? It means that I have to keep walking. I don't sit down. I don't get stuck. I have to allow him to bring me through. Because there's another that's going to come through that same valley. And it was not the reason for me getting through for myself. But it was for him to grow me so that I could be compassionate. I can be sensitive. So when others are coming through the valley of the shadow of death, I can be compassionate to those. And I can tell him if he got me through, he can get you through. I can be that encourager. I can be that, that hope that says that God will. We'll get you through. I become that witness. And I can tell them about the goodness, the mercy, and the grace of God. You know why God gets you through so many difficult situations and you may have made a decision and a choice that did not work out the way that you thought it would work out. But God said, I can use this for my good. I can use it for my purpose. I can let you know that even though you might have made a choice that did not come, that may not have been in your best interest, it may not have done what you wanted to do, but I'm going to use it to let you know that you have to say, Lead, guide me, O oh, thy great Jehovah. I'm a pilgrim in this barren land. I am weak and thou art mighty. Hold me the next time that I have to make a choice of decision. I will take time to pray and ask God for his his guidance but he wants us to know that the purposes of God will always overcome the plans of men instead of beating yourself up over your mistakes or arguing about who's right and who's wrong pray to see the hand of God of God in it and that's what you have to do instead of just just beating you up and Saying what a bad choice it is. And we have to make sure that we're around people when we make mistakes or we make choices that they didn't want us to make. They may have wanted us to make another choice or another decision. We have to make sure we surround ourselves with people that can encourage us, that can lift us up, to let us know that we will always make some decisions that others may not like. We may make some decisions that we may not like, uh, but we don't beat ourselves up. We don't keep calling ourselves stupid. We don't keep calling ourselves crazy. We don't keep calling ourselves this or that because when we keep doing that the Bible says Satan has come to kill steal and uh, destroy and I just come by to tell you whenever you're so critical of yourself whenever you keep putting yourself down you have basically you've engaged in what Satan's mission and plan is if he can ever cause you to doubt yourself if he can ever cause you to doubt God, uh, then he will 
who cause you to isolate. He'll cause you to go into a place where no one can reach you. He'll cause you to hide in a cave because you're intimidated by the circumstances. He'll cause you to not want to engage in relationships anymore. And I just come by to tell you that you ought to give yourself a break because let me tell you, God gives you breaks. It's called his mercy and his grace. He continued to give you unconditional love. And I just come by to tell you that you ought to know that in every situation as a child of God, he has a purpose that's in it. So you need to continue to ask the question, Lord, what do you want me to learn through this? Lord, what are you trying to teach me? And I just come by to tell you maybe his purpose is to teach you some patience. Maybe his purpose is to teach you some peace. Maybe his purpose is to let you come to understand the realness of the Holy Spirit. Maybe his purpose is that you become a witness for him. He's already saying that I want you to be a witness. And when the Holy Spirit come upon you, then you will go to Jerusalem. You'll go to Judea. You'll go to Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. And God wants to use you. He wants to use your situation for his good, for his purpose. Because when somebody asks you, how did you get through this? How did you get through that? You can tell them it was God who brought me through. It was not myself. It was not my intelligence. It was my, my, my ability. But it was nothing but the power and the presence of an almighty God empowered by the Holy Spirit. So number one, what can we learn from this lesson? You must listen to God. The second, the purposes of God will always overcome the plans of men. Give yourself a break. Number three, and finally, whatever you've lost, God can restore. Isn't that good news? You ought to look at this. It began to pick up. It says the people of Malta honored us. You'll find it in Acts 28 and verse number 10. It says the people of Malta honored us in many ways. And when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies that we needed. I just come by to tell you that God will restore unto you that which was lost. And I just come by to tell you sometimes people may find themselves in an unpeaceful situation. But when you avail yourself and surrender to the power and the provision and the presence of the Holy Spirit, he'll return unto you your peace. Hear David saying, return unto me the joy of my salvation. And I just come by to tell you that when you find yourself losing things, don't get discouraged. You may lose a house in a fire. You may lose, come on somebody. You may lose a job. But I just come by to tell you, if you know that God will, God will and get you through it. He'll restore unto you that which has been lost. I just come by to tell you he'll get you through. Let me just show you something. I just come by to tell you that when 
again when you lose your peace of mind God says I'll give you my peace of mind well how is that you have to go over to Isaiah 26 3 he says if you keep your mind stayed on me he will give you perfect peace anybody in here need his perfect peace there's some people huh, who's sitting right around you huh, and need the perfect peace huh, he'll restore huh, he will give them back huh, because God is not huh, an Indian giver huh, he won't give it huh, and he won't take it away huh, but God huh, he will huh, he will restore huh, you back to that huh, which you had huh. I just come by to tell you huh, that you need to know huh, that God will uh, see you through. Uh, let me just tell you, uh, he brought the Hebrew boys uh, uh, through the fiery furnace. Uh, he brought Daniel uh, uh, through a lion's den. Uh, the Israelites uh, uh, through the Red Sea. Uh, Paul and Silas uh, uh, through jail. Uh, Peter uh, uh, through a storm. Uh, and I just come by to tell you, uh, one Friday, uh, I wish I had some witnesses up in here. Uh, one Friday, Jesus went to a cross. One Friday, they put nails in his hands and nails in his feet. One Friday, they lifted him high, stretched him wide. On that Friday, he prayed a prayer. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. One Friday, the sun refused to shine it got dark the earth reeled in rock like a drunken man the temple curtain was rent torn from the top to the bottom a centurion soldier cried out sure this must be the son of God on that Friday he said it's finished not that he was finished but the mission that his father had sent him on it looked pretty dim and it looked pretty dark but when the sun refused to shine the issue in he began to actualize he began to fulfill that that he prayed in John 17 Father glorify the Son Father allow the Son to glorify the Father and the only way that the S-O-N can glorify lift up the Father shine brightly for the Father is that it's in a dark dim and looking situation it was dark on that Friday the Son refused to shine but he says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw. My death will draw because the whole world will know that God loves them while they are sinners. And the S-U-N refused to shine. But the S-O-N glorified the Father. He shined. He shined. What did he shine? He shined the love of God he shine the mercy of God he shine the grace of God he shine the forgiveness of God he shine shine until he died on that cross and once he died Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus went to Pilate, requested his body, put him in a bar or tomb. It looked like it was over. It looked like he was lost. But I'm so glad. What come on somebody? He looked at that he was defeated, but he stayed there all Friday night. Stayed there all Saturday, Saturday night. But God had promised that he would raise him in three days that's why I get so excited when the preacher began to sing a song the title of the song is early early that's music to my ears early early 
Sunday morning. He was raised from the dead with all power, all power, all power, resurrection power, reconciliation power, restoring power, eternal life power, forgiving power, loving power, saving power, all power in his hands in heaven and in earth God promise is true what God says he'll do he will do if he says he'll bring you through won't he bring you through is there anybody in here who knows what I'm talking about however the Holy Spirit moves you if he moves you to say amen you ought to say amen if he moves you to stand on your feet you ought to stand on your feet if he moves you just wave your hand you ought to wave your hand he moves you just nod your head you ought to nod your head he moves you to just shed a tear you ought to shed a tear because you come to truly understand God will God will see me through is there anybody in here who knows what I'm talking about you know what I'm talking about say amen 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 I know he'll see you through he saw me through when I was two years old. The doctor didn't know if I was going to live through midnight. But I'm so glad that I had somebody, my mama and my daddy and my grandmama in 4th Street. Good hope and others were praying for me. Mama Jessie was praying for me because I could not pray for myself. And I I'm a living testimony that God saw me through. Yay! Yay! Ah, yay! Is there anybody you know what I'm talking about? He saved my soul. He's made me home. One of these old days, he's going to call my name. But I'm glad that he'll see me through. I don't have a doubt. I don't have a worry that when the death angel come knocking on my door, I'll be able to say, it's well, it's well, it's well, it's well, with my soul. It's well with my soul. Will you be able to say that? That it's well with your soul. When you're in dark and dire situations, can you say God will see me through? I may not know how. I may not know when. But my faith says he will. He will. He will. He will, he will see you through. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God will see you through. If there's someone here today who have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. He wants to see you through this life of sin by allowing you to enter into a life eternal. And how can you do that? You must, the Bible says, confess with your mouth that Jesus the Christ is Lord. And God has raised him from the dead. And he says, you will be rescued from the power and the penalty of sin. You will be rescued and you will be saved. You will be extended eternal life. And you will be dwelt with his Holy Spirit until he calls you home. You have helped him see you through. You may be here and maybe you said that I really don't believe that. But let me tell you something. We're all going to die. You have to ask yourself, where will I spend eternity? 
Will I spend it with him? Or will I spend it apart from him? But you will have an eternal destiny. The only way that you can spend it with him is that you must believe that for God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed it didn't say have to feel or understand. Just believe. Shall not perish but have eternal life. If you're here today, I want to ask you if you would step out right now and give yourself away. Receive his will. Transfer your will for his will surrender your will for his will in the name of Jesus you ought to come today unashamed, unembarrassed his arms are wide open to receive you because he wants you to get through this life with peace, with joy he wants you to get through this life with his protection, with his love and his grace and his mercy that you may be an example, you may be a witness to others that he can draw through you. Don't allow other voices to speak to you to keep you from receiving that which he has already given don't allow your fear don't allow your doubt don't allow your apprehension don't allow your even your intelligence to cause you to deny 